Welcome to this week's episode of Ascend, Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin, and this is my co-host, Will Vernick. Yep. Tell us about your shirt, Will. This week's shirt is the Cal State East, East Bay Alumni shirt. I got this after graduating from Cal State East Bay in spring 2012. I I wear this shirt to remind every to tell everyone where I, where I've graduated from. This shirt is a symbol of of my of my time at in Hayward. Thank you, Will. Today our program is on autism, self advocacy, and the independent life, and our main guest is Michael Dyer, Behavioral Analyst, and we'll begin our questions with Will. Oh, oh uh, that, welcome, Michael. Tell us how, about your practice as a behavioral therapist. Well, <clears throat> first, thank you, Will, for um, giving me this opportunity to um, talk this morning. Um, my background um, in working in this particular field um, goes clear back to 1980 um, after graduating um, from um, UC Berkeley, moving to Sonoma County, um, started working um, with individuals with um, developmental disabilities. In particular, was working with um, a lot of adults who were moving into the community uh, for the first time since, um, in many cases, since they were young children, exiting um, the developmental center is in Napa and um, Sonoma County. Um, over the, the years, my um, specialty has been really working with individuals who have real severe um, and challenging behaviors um, that were prohibiting them from being able to access um, a lot of the um, activities and um, resources that are available in our communities. Um, that included, you know, day program and vocational activity, independent living, supported living. Um, and now I'm really working a lot with um, individuals who are now um, back where I was in 1980, learning um, how to uh, work best in this field, how to support individuals um, on the spectrum um, rather than um, controlling those individuals or having any particular type of agenda um, other than trying to help those individuals um, identify their, what they determine is their quality of life and then supporting them and being able to acquire the skills necessary to um, have that quality of life. Interesting. And how did you train for, for your profession? How, more import <clears throat> and more importantly, how long have you been in it? Well, I've been in it, um, as um, I just stated, since about 1980. Um, I, I am an individual who, um, upon graduation, um, had absolutely no intent in working in the field of with developmental disabilities. To my surprise, almost 35 years later, it is my life and it's my passion. Um, so I, unlike a lot of individuals who had a tremendous amount of experience or exposure to maybe individuals um, through respite services or a variety of different uh, venues, uh, and said, you know, this is something I want to spend my life doing. I came out of kind of in a, a, a backdoor fashion. I would like to think that m most of my uh, um, education has come through the experiences and the individuals and the families um, that I've worked with have taught me um, the value of listening, the value of being able to um, help families to assert, learn how to assert themselves, putting myself and my agenda on the back burner. Oftentimes that's very challenging um, to do, um, and I haven't always been successful in doing that, but that is, um, I think, the main essence of what has allowed me to continue in this work um, over the variety of years and doing the variety of different activities that I have in the field. That's, that's great to hear, and did, did you, and now on to to more to more lively question. <laughs> Do you work exclusively with adults with autism or with other groups that may require that that have similar disabilities but but not as but not as but not as known? I work um, 
with a variety of different individuals um, that all, all generally would fall under the classification of developmental disabilities um, and a variety of different age groups. Um, I have individuals that I'm working with right now and have had long-term relationships with that are in their 80s. Um, I have some individuals who uh, um, are working right now, and I am actually sometimes the first person that's in their home after a diagnosis is made at two and a half or three years old. So the sp wide spectrum, again, because of my focus is, is on really being able to uh, empower the family to um, assist their own children um, or the individual that's 80 to learn how to be able to possibly learn how to advocate for his, himself or herself um, around um, caregivers that might be necessary because of their um, issues with aging. Um, all of those things are interrelated and the same skill set is necessary for all of those individuals regardless of their age, um, what their cultural background is, what their disability is. Uh, that's good to hear. and. And and to to coincide with that, what are some of the keys to independent living success that that you'd like to share? I think if I could condense things down, one of the main um, two components of that is number one is um, the willingness to uh, um, to recognize that you you need assistance. And the second is the willingness to accept assistance when it's provided. Um, an individual, um, no matter who they are, if they're willing to accept the as assistance that's being provided for them, can excel in lots of different areas of their life. Um, you asked earlier about my own um, professional development and growth. Um, <clears throat> I wasn't always good at doing that myself. So I've learned from my own life experiences how to better accept assistance. But those people that know me well would say that I'm still oftentimes resistant to that input, which probably impacts my quality of life in a negative way. Taking that into the life of other individuals is being able to say um, and help them to, through experience, um, learn that it's okay to accept assistance, that it's not a sign of weakness, but it's actually a sign of strength to be able to ask for help and accept assistance um, as long as you're not compromising your values and the things that you're striving for um, around independent living, uh, um, which is, again, kind of a misnomer in terms of what is independent living. It's different for everybody. Interesting. And and if, if you, and if you'd like to like to comment, what are some of the, of the behaviors you help adults with autism to address that, that, they, um, that they can apply in their everyday lives? Well, go, following up with the question, you know, what I just spoke of is a, the uh, individual's ability to really uh, learn to, um, in a sense, be self-critical, not in a bad way, but being able to look and say, what are the things that are possibly going on in my life that are keeping me from being able to accomplish the things that I want to do? And second to that is that it, the, the, the work that I can do is to help to uh, create a situation or an environment where the person is motivated and learns that, um, and maybe very small steps to start off with, to accept assistance to look at other people's perspectives and point of view uh, about particular situations rather than being l potentially locked into just being able to say, this is what I believe, this is what I'm going to do. Um, and basically, you know, s c the old term is to cut off your nose to spite yourself. Um, it has a lot of truth to it. And to be able to help individuals do that, it seems those are very complex issues. Uh, for some individuals. Um, and the wonderful part of uh, um, working with young individuals and young families is that many of, of those families can start um, helping their children and themselves to acquire those skills very early on. Uh, many of the individuals that are older um, have not had that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes they're, for the first time in their life, there being th these concepts and the I ideas are being addressed and sometimes can be very confusing and can create a situation where um, 
the individual actually, again, re resists the help that's being offered to them, even though they've asked for the help. And that can be, again, a very complex situation and takes a lot of patience and time to allow that individual to come to the conclusion themselves, hopefully, that accepting assistance is not a bad thing. Well put. And, and last, last question, do people ever change destructive behaviors or, or do they just go, just go along with them? Good question. Um, first of all, what we have to look at is what are destructive behaviors. Um, there are certain things that we would look at that are illegal, certain things that we would look at that we would say in terms of our background, our perspective would be unethical, and then there's a variety of different layers of what would be destructive, but things such as um, behaviors that are um, where they're hurting somebody else, either physically or through their words, we might call that verbal aggression, um, they're hurting themselves um, through their own particular behavior, that could be substance abuse, um, it could be actual damage to the actual body, um, and a variety of other um, conditions um, that would be again, seen by most of individuals in society as, as being barriers to being able to be an active participant in their communities. Um, can people change? Absolutely. Um, what we look at in terms of being a behavior analyst is helping people to discover what we sometimes call the function of the behavior. A simpler way to look at it is asking the person or learning how, why is that person engaging in that destructive behavior? What is it about the environment or what is it about their background or their history that contributes to them continuing to engage in that destructive behavior? Once we've been able to identify that, we are able to offer the individual opportunities to be able to learn new skills. Um, that is the uh, key element of this whole process is offering people alternative or what we call replacement skills. So if a person is, as an example, Will, you, um, uh, when they're frustrated, they scream and yell and curse. And when they do that, people around them leave them alone and they get what they want and they learn maybe not even cognitively, but they learn that screaming, yelling, cursing gets them what they want, and that becomes then possibly uh, uh, something that is happening more and more frequent in their life. So it's happening with those people at home, on their work site, their bus drivers, the people at the grocery store. And so in across many different environments, they're engaging in a very destructive behavior, sometimes with no self-awareness of that, but it's ultimately getting them what they want. What we can do is help the person to be able to identify that, and we're talking in particular adults at this point in time. We might work differently if an individual is younger with adults to be able to help them identify that and then helping them to, to be able to look at what are other alternative ways to be able to learn how to manage um, your frustration or your anger or, anger or your emotions in terms of being able to self-regulate, um, learning how to uh, bring yourself to a place that sometimes we call um, self-soothing, um, being able yourself to be able to identify that, oh, I'm escalating um, in my behavior. Um, there's alternative things I can do so that I don't escalate and I don't get kicked out of my job, or most importantly, I don't cuss, swear, and do the things that I know have led to um, me not being able to get what I want. Um, and oftentimes that creates a struggle because a person may um, be able to say, well, of course, you know, I don't want to do these particular behaviors. But they're caught in a trap because they've practiced doing those behaviors thousands and thousands and thousands of times. So it takes time to change those. So yes, people can change those behaviors, but oftentimes too, within our culture, we tend to want to things to come quickly. And that can then be very frustrating for families, caregivers, et cetera, when it's been, uh, and, and so what we have to be able to identify is that these sometimes destructive behaviors um, are a lifetime process. Michael, you've mentioned that your clients uh, are a wide variety of ages and functionalities. Mm -hmm. um, 
other types of factors too. So based upon your dealings with them, are there any features you have in, that they have in common as being part of the spectrum and distinguishing them from uh, other types of patients that you deal with? Yes, but I will say that with, um, with some hesitation is that we want to look at every individual I want to look at every individual that is referred to me as a unique individual and not categorize them by some type of test, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But given the fact that um, autism is a spectrum disorder, it impacts everybody different. But there are almost always um, communication issues, mm -hmm. both uh, um, what might a person might be able to, in terms of understanding, but expressing. Understanding is very challenging because we can't see that. We don't know that, but what we can do is observe what the person's behavior is, and if they're able to um, learn how to express themselves better. Um, also, sometimes there are the, the social issues of an individual who really has a desire to be more independent, but has particular behaviors that tend to isolate them or to uh, be um, characterized by people in the community, maybe even as aggressive, when the intent is not that they're aggressive. Um, and then there are others, uh, behaviors that um, can be, that again are in spectrum, depends on how uh, they manifest themselves uh, in terms of uh, how people might use their hands, um, being able to make eye contact, mm -hmm. um, the social distance that they have between individuals that are oftentimes um, never spoken about, but will impact their ability to be successful. So as an example of that would be an individual who needs and is asking for assistance at the grocery store. But when they ask somebody, they close the space in so um, close that um, it is a cultural issue in terms of, oh, when I close that space in, the other, per the other person reacts maybe in a way of pulling back. And it mm -hmm. creates a whole chain or cycle of events. If we can help that individual to whatever age they are, to understand the social distance and um, how we might be able to um, address a helper versus your teacher at school versus how you would do that with a brother or sister. All those social distances are different, um, never stated, but they're different. And um, it doesn't matter what age you are, mm -hmm. what disability you are, those things will impact your quality of life or can impact your quality of life um, if... Um, not adhered to. We might be able to say, well, that's not fair, but we have to be able to say, well, that's the way it is. Um, there are certain things that we can't change, and learning to be able to accept the things we can't change um, is a very powerful tool. Let's focus on the things we can change. Exactly. Now, when a client comes to see you for the first time, do you rely on existing evaluations of their uh, situation? Do you do your own? Do you do a combination? Tell us about that. The last is what we do, a combination. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at is, again, is to be able to say, what is, what is this person's history? What do they come to this from other people's perspectives? If that individual is able to do a self-interview, great. But we interview the parents, um, oftentimes, or their caregivers. Um, it depends on if the person is conserved or not. We'll get the permission to be able to speak to people that um, have influenced that individual's life. Um, and that could include, um, again, a variety of things. And then there are definitely very formal testing mm -hmm. tools that we use that help to determine, for instance, the function of a particular behavior, when it occurs, um, and what might be reinforcing that particular behavior. I understand. I also understand that there are a variety of uh, behavioral techniques. Cut! What? All right. Sorry about that. I was just going to say we need a little more range. Let's go back to the previous question. What? <coughs> what do you mean? Oh, Am I too soft? Yes. That's why I was trying to... Michael, I understand that there are a variety of behavioral uh, therapy techniques that are used by various therapists. How would you describe yours? I would describe mine as a board-certified behavior analyst as being very mainstream in that what we look at and we adhere to are 
interventions that are verifiable, that have been shown repeatedly to be successful. Unless we're in some type of experimental mode where we're working with individuals, we decline um, working with interventions that do not have the variability, that kind of, of um, background. Um, sometimes that is upsetting or perplexing to families, especially in this media-rich community that we live in, where they'll hear something and it'll be some kind of anecdotal um, issue. We, we completely reject those um, in terms of not hearing what the family has to say, but in terms of put, putting that into um, a treatment plan for that particular individual. Care, things that we would be looking at would be um, what is... Um, what are individuals that have um, typical um, development, um, what are the skills that they normally have? Those would be kind of no normalized tests. Not about uh, intellect, et cetera, but again, mm -hmm. four-year-olds do this in terms of their play activity. Fourteen-year-olds do this. And look at those and to see where the gap may be between where that individual is in terms of their skills and what we need to do to help teach that individual how to acquire that skill. Much of that, again, is the history of, the, of that individual. How do they best learn? Do they learn through um, the in, by modeling? Do they um, learn best by uh, breaking the task down into multiple different steps? So, again, that's where it's individualized. But what we do, again, go back to is the different techniques. When sometimes the confusion is uh, hear from individuals, oh, do you do ABA? Dispel the myth. Applied behavioral analysis is basically how all of us as human beings acquire skills regardless of disability, regardless of age, regardless of background. There are certain universal principles in terms of how we acquire new skills and why we acquire new skills. Going back to that mm -hmm. question of function, what might be the reason why we engage in a particular behavior that may be now maladaptive? Um, and, but those are universals. So we look at that and we, able, we dispel that myth of being able to say that uh, throwing out the term, well, we do ABA versus doing some other type of intervention. And what I want to be able to say is there's a lot of other good interventions. With, but as a behavior analyst, we stay highly focused in terms of helping that person in terms of their actual behavior, what we can observe, not what necessarily they, they're thinking or what they're feeling, but the observable behavior and the impact of that behavior on those around them. I understand. At the risk of pigeonholing uh, you, would you describe yourself as an ABA type of therapist? Absolutely. Again, I'm hearing to the principles um, of applied behavioral analysis. I won't bore your, the listeners with um, what those are, but again, that they're empirically valid, that they're, um, we look at the best way and the most efficient way for that person to acquire those new skills. And then we measure those, and we hold ourselves accountable to those things. Um, sometimes individuals will think that we're too data-driven, but that's what actually tells us that it's not just our opinion about what's going on. So again, going back to the example we talked about, we can actually measure and help that person determine their social distance. Are they learning that skill? And if they're not, it's up to myself to be able to adjust and to modify that intervention so that that person can acquire that skill. Um, and again, that may be something that takes quite a bit of time um, since a person may be uh, have engaged in that behavior again for years. And, and it's the first time they've become aware that that is a problem and it's a particular behavior that has gotten them into, into um, difficulties in terms of uh, their, what they're aspiring um, to do. Michael, you have been a fascinating guest mm -hmm. and I know we're going to want to have you back. But in the meantime, how can our viewers get in touch with you? The best way to get in touch with me <clears throat> is through email. Um, so I believe that there'll be some kind of moniker up on the um, screen. Um, if you just add a K in between Michael and Dyer, Michael K. Dyer at Comcast.net. Um, I will do my best if there are people that have inquiries about what I do or just interest to respond to those individuals. Um, just in closing, I do that 
um, as a public benefit through uh, the nonprofit corporation that I run called Technical Assistance and Support Services. So that, again, is where the support services come in, is that when people contact me, I can direct them to what I believe might be a valuable re community resource. Also letting them know that, um, again, I may not be able to solve every particular problem. Uh, don't put that out as being able to say, I'm the fix-it guy, contact me, everything will be okay. But again, it's another resource, and to look at that again. So that is Michael K. Dyer at Comcast.net. By the way, Will, thanks a lot. Appreciate um, the time this morning. It, it, was, it was my pleasure. You, you've you been a great guest great guest today. And great. Thanks for the, um, the questions. My mind is spinning with being able to continue to talk about those and to be able to um, be challenged myself in terms of my own approach to individuals that are neurotypical. Excellent. We are really glad you've been here. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And now our co-host Stacy Kennedy will introduce and interview our neurodiversity correspondent Ed Denneby. Hello, good evening, Edward. Um, I understand you are a neurodiversity consultant. Could you um, share some of the things that um, are activities that um, that happen with that? I uh, advocate for adults who are in need of wraparound services because they are cognitively and behaviorally different. So I focus on the federal program, the Administration for Community Living, and helping to raise awareness about what this program offers and to make sure that community organizations have a point of contact for best practices. Wonderful. So tell us some about your um, local activities. Uh, I we focus on jobs, housing, and social inclusion, and w work to develop community partnerships uh, with nonprofits and local government to increase availability of services, uh, both with the Department of Adult and Aging Services, the Department of Public Health, civil society organizations, such as church groups uh, and other community organizations, to make sure that there are a community of organized, evidence-based local services for special needs adults. So over the years, um, how, is, how, um, how have been the results? Um, has it been, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's like easy, stuff like that takes a while, but um, how have the results been? Like in the last year or a couple of years, ha, um, are th these people happy? Well, in the 50 years since the Older Americans Act was passed, mm -hmm. which w really began the current era of, of funding for local services, yes. there's been a complete evolution. As the percentage of Americans with special needs, either because they're seniors or because they're persons of, uh, with disabilities, has increased and uh, the healthcare system has advanced, the, uh, the, the, there's so much more depth of, of services available to people and there's a need for a new way for people to find where those services are located and how to evaluate them so that they're effective in their lives. Right. Is there any links or websites that you suggest that people go to who are looking for a service like that? Well, an example is the Autism Now website that the federal government has set up, uh -huh. uh, which includes a directory, services, uh, directory service facility to find by zip code what autism services are there. Right. Okay, well, that, that's great information, and thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ed. I just wanted to let our viewers know that we will be seeing uh, Ed on an occasional basis, uh, giving developments from the neurodiversity community, as well as giving uh, events that are of interest to our viewers here. So thank you very much again, Ed. And as I say it, and it's certainly true in your case, we're going to be seeing you again very soon. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. This is our program for this week, and as always, this is not our program. This is your program. So if you have anything you want to say, anything you want to show us, or even better, want to be on our program, let us know. It's your program. We just do it. So for this week, I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. Stacy Kennedy. Okay. Until next week. This is Ascend Life on the Autism Spectrum. Have a great week. Tune in next week.